Moby Dick, chapters 92 to 96. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 92 to 96. Chapter 92 Ambergris. Now this ambergris is a very curious substance, and so important as an article of commerce, that in 1791 a certain Nantucket-born Captain Coffin was examined at the bar of the English House of Commons on the subject. For at that time, and indeed until a comparatively late day, the precise origin of ambergris remained, like amber itself, a problem to the learned. Though the word ambergris is but a French compound for grey amber, yet the two substances are quite distinct. For amber, though at times found on the sea coast, is also dug up in some far inland soils, whereas ambergris is never found except upon the sea. Besides, amber is a hard, transparent, brittle, odorless substance used for mouthpieces to pipes, for beads and ornaments. But ambergris is soft, waxy, and so highly fragrant and spicy that it is largely used in perfumery, in pastilles, precious candles, hair powders, and pomatum. The Turks use it in cooking, and also carry it to Mecca for the same purpose that frankincense is carried to St. Peter's in Rome. Some wine merchants drop a few grains into claret to flavor it. Who would think, then, that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with an essence found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale? Yet so it is. By some, ambergris is supposed to be the cause, and by others the effect, of the dyspepsia in the whale. How to cure such a dyspepsia it were hard to say, unless by administering three or four boatloads of brandreth pills, and then running out of harm's way, as laborers do in blasting rocks. I have forgotten to say that there were found in this ambergris certain hard, round, bony plates, which at first Stubb thought might be sailors' trousers' buttons, but afterwards it turned out that they were nothing more than pieces of small squid bones embalmed in that manner. Now, that the incorruption of this most fragrant ambergris should be found in the heart of such decay, is this nothing? Bethink thee of that saying of St. Paul in Corinthians about corruption and incorruption, how that we are sown in dishonor but raised in glory, and likewise call to mind that saying of Paracelsus about what it is that maketh the best musk, also forget not the strange fact that of all things of ill savour, cologne water in its rudimental manufacturing stages is the worst. I should like to conclude the chapter with the above appeal, but cannot, owing to my anxiety to repel a charge often made against whalemen, and which, in the estimation of some already biased minds, might be considered as indirectly substantiated by what has been said of the Frenchman's two whales. Elsewhere in this volume the slanderous aspersion has been disproved, that the vocation of whaling is throughout a slatternly, untidy business. But there is another thing to rebut. They hint that all whales always smell bad. Now how did this odious stigma originate? I opine that it is plainly traceable to the first arrival of the Greenland whaling ships in London, more than two centuries ago, because those whalemen did not then, and do not now, try out their oil at sea, as the southern ships have always done, but cutting up the fresh blubber into small bits, thrust it through the bungholes of large casks, and carry it home in that manner, the shortness of the season in those icy seas, and the sudden and violent storms to which they are exposed, forbidding any other course. The consequence is, that upon breaking into the hold, and unloading one of these whale cemeteries in the Greenland dock, a savour is given forth somewhat similar to that arising from excavating an old city graveyard for the foundations of a lying-in hospital." 
I partly surmise also that this wicked charge against whalers may be likewise imputed to the existence on the coast of Greenland in former times of a Dutch village called Schmerenberg or Smeerenberg, which latter name is the one used by the learned Fogo von Slack in his great work on smells, a textbook on that subject. As its name imports, smear, fat, berg, to put up, this village was founded in order to afford a place for the blubber of the Dutch whale fleet to be tried out, without being taken home to Holland for that purpose. It was a collection of furnaces, fat kettles, and oil sheds, and when the works were in full operation certainly gave forth no very pleasant savour. But all this is quite different with a South Sea sperm whaler, which, in a voyage of four years, perhaps, after completely filling her hold with oil, does not, perhaps, consume fifty days in the business of boiling out, and, in the state that it is casked, the oil is nearly scentless. The truth is that, living or dead, if but decently treated, whales as a species are by no means creatures of ill odour, nor can whalemen be recognized as the people of the Middle Ages affected to detect a Jew in the company by the nose. Nor, indeed, can the whale possibly be otherwise than fragrant, when, as a general thing, he enjoys such high health, taking abundance of exercise, always out of doors, though, it is true, seldom in the open air. I say that the motion of a sperm whale's flukes above water dispenses a perfume, as when a musk-scented lady rustles her dress in a warm parlour. What then shall I liken the sperm whale to for fragrance, considering his magnitude? Must it not be to that famous elephant with jewelled tusks and redolent with myrrh, which was led out of an Indian town to do honour to Alexander the Great? Chapter 93. The Castaway It was but some few days after encountering the Frenchman that a most significant event befell the most insignificant of the Pequod's crew, an event most lamentable, and which ended in providing the sometimes madly merry and predestinated craft with a living and ever-accompanying prophecy of whatever shattered sequel might prove her own. Now, in the whale-ship it is not every one that goes in the boats. Some few hands are reserved called ship-keepers, whose province it is to work the vessel while the boats are pursuing the whale. As a general thing, these ship-keepers are as hardy fellows as the men comprising the boat's crew. But if there happens to be an unduly slender, clumsy, or timorous white in the ship, that white is certain to be made a ship-keeper. It was so in the Pequod with the little negro Pippin, by nickname, Pip by abbreviation. Poor Pip! You have heard of him before. You must remember his tambourine on that dramatic midnight, so gloomy jolly. In outer aspect, Pip and Doughboy made a match, like a black pony and a white one, of equal developments, though of dissimilar color, driven in one eccentric span. But while hapless Doughboy was by nature dull and torpid in his intellects, Pip, though over-tender-hearted, was at bottom very bright, with that pleasant, genial, jolly brightness peculiar to his tribe, a tribe which ever enjoy all holidays and festivities with finer, freer relish than any other race. For blacks the year's calendar should show naught but three hundred and sixty-five Fourth of Julys and New Year's Days. Nor smile so while I write that this little black was brilliant, for even blackness has its brilliancy, behold yon lustrous ebony, panelled in king's cabinets. But Pip loved life and all life's peaceable securities, so that the panic-striking business in which he had somehow unaccountably become entrapped had most sadly blurred his brightness, though, as ere long will be seen, what was thus temporarily subdued in him, in the end was destined to be luridly illuminated by strange wild fires, that fictitiously showed him off to ten times the natural luster with which, in his native Tallinn County in Connecticut, he had once enlivened many a fiddler's frolic on the green, and at melodious eventide with his gay ha-ha had turned the round horizon into one star-belled tambourine. So, though in the clear air of day, suspended against a blue-veined neck, 
the pure watered diamond drop will healthful glow, yet when the cunning jeweller would show you the diamond in its most impressive luster, he lays it against a gloomy ground, and then lights it up, not by the sun, but by some unnatural gases. Then come out those fiery effulgences, infernally superb, then the evil blazing diamond, once the divinest symbol of the crystal skies, looks like some crown jewel stolen from the king of hell. But let us to the story. It came to pass that in the Ambergris affair Stubbs after Oarsman chanced so to sprain his hand as for a time to become quite maimed, and temporarily Pip was put in his place. The first time Stubb lowered with him, Pip evinced much nervousness, but happily for that time escaped close contact with the whale, and therefore came off not altogether discreditably, though Stubb, observing him, took care afterwards to exhort him to cherish his courageousness to the utmost, for he might often find it needful. Now, upon the second lowering, the boat paddled upon the whale, and as the fish received the darted iron, it gave its customary rap which happened in this instance to be right under poor Pip's seat. The involuntary consternation of the moment caused him to leap, paddle in hand, out of the boat, and in such a way that part of the slack whale line coming against his chest, he breasted it overboard with him so as to become entangled in it, when at last plumping into the water. That instant the stricken whale started on a fierce run, the line swiftly straightened, and presto, poor Pip came all foaming up to the chocks of the boat, remorselessly dragged there by the line which had taken several turns around his chest and neck. Tashtego stood in the bows. He was full of the fire of the hunt. He hated Pip for a poltroon. Snatching the boat knife from its sheath, he suspended its sharp edge over the line, and turning towards Stubb, exclaimed interrogatively, Cut! Meantime, Pip's blue, choked face plainly looked, Do, for God's sake! All passed in a flash. In less than half a minute, this entire thing happened. Damn him, cut! roared Stubb, and so the whale was lost, and Pip was saved. So soon as he recovered himself, the poor little negro was assailed by yells and execrations from the crew. Tranquilly permitting these irregular cursings to evaporate, Stubb then, in a plain, business-like, but still half-humorous manner, cursed Pip officially, and that done unofficially gave him much wholesome advice. The substance was, never jump from a boat, Pip, except— but all the rest was indefinite, as the soundest advice ever is. Now, in general, stick to the boat is your true motto in whaling. But cases will sometimes happen when leap from the boat is still better. Moreover, as if perceiving at last that if he should give undiluted conscientious advice to Pip, he would be leaving him too wide a margin to jump in for the future, Stubb suddenly dropped all advice and concluded with a peremptory command, Stick to the boat, Pip, or by the Lord I won't pick you up if you jump, mind that. We can't afford to lose whales by the likes of you. A whale would sell for thirty times what you would, Pip, in Alabama. Bear that in mind, and don't jump any more. Hereby, perhaps, Stubb indirectly hinted that, though man loved his fellow, yet man is a money-making animal, which propensity too often interferes with his benevolence. But we are all in the hands of the gods, and Pip jumped again. It was under very similar circumstances to the first performance, but this time he did not breast out the line, and hence when the whale started to run, Pip was left behind on the sea, like a hurried traveller's trunk. Alas, Stubb was but too true to his word. It was a beautiful, bounteous blue day, the spangled sea calm and cool, and flatly stretching away all round to the horizon, like gold-beater's skin hammered out to the extremist. Bobbing up and down in that sea, Pip's ebon head showed like a head of cloves. No boat-knife was lifted when he fell so rapidly astern. Stubb's inexorable back was turned upon him, and the whale was winged. In three minutes a whole mile of shoreless ocean was between Pip and Stubb, out of the centre of the sea, poor Pip turned his crisp, curling black head to the sun, 
another lonely castaway, though the loftiest and the brightest. Now, in calm weather, to swim in the open ocean is as easy to the practiced swimmer as to ride in a spring carriage ashore, but the awful lonesomeness is intolerable. The intense concentration of self in the middle of such a heartless immensity, my God, who can tell it? Mark how when sailors in a dead calm bathe in the open sea, mark how closely they hug their ship, and only coast along her sides. But had Stubb really abandoned the poor little negro to his fate? No, he did not mean to, at least, because there were two boats in his wake, and he supposed no doubt that they would, of course, come up to Pip very quickly, and pick him up though indeed such considerations towards oarsmen jeopardized through their own timidity is not always manifested by the hunters in all similar instances, and such instances not unfrequently occur. Almost invariably in the fishery, a coward, so called, is marked with the same ruthless detestation peculiar to military navies and armies. But it so happened that those boats, without seeing Pip, suddenly spying whales close to them on one side, turned and gave chase, and Stubb's boat was now so far away, and he and all his crew so intent upon the fish, that Pip's ringed horizon began to expand around him miserably. By the merest chance the ship itself at last rescued him, but from that hour the little negro went about the deck an idiot, such at least they said he was. The sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though, rather carried down alive to wondrous depths, where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the miser merman, wisdom, revealed his hoarded heaps, and among the joyous, heartless, ever-juvenile eternities, Pip saw the multitudinous, God-omnipresent, coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom, and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. So man's insanity is heaven's sense, and wandering from all mortal reason, man comes at last to that celestial thought which to reason is absurd and frantic and weal or woe feels then uncompromised, indifferent as his God. For the rest, blame not Stubb too hardly. The thing is common in that fishery, and in the sequel of the narrative it will then be seen what like abandonment befell myself. CHAPTER Ninety Four, A SQUEEZE OF THE HAND that whale of Stubbs, so dearly purchased, was duly brought to the Pequod's side, where all those cutting and hoisting operations previously detailed were regularly gone through, even to the bailing of the Heidelberg tun, or case. While some were occupied with this latter duty, others were employed in dragging away the larger tubs so soon as filled with the sperm, and when the proper time arrived, this same sperm was carefully manipulated ere going to the triworks, of which anon. It had cooled and crystallized to such a degree that when, with several others, I sat down before a large Constantine's bath of it, I found it strangely concreted into lumps, here and there rolling about in the liquid part. It was our business to squeeze these lumps back into fluid. A sweet and unctuous duty! No wonder that in old times this sperm was such a favorite cosmetic, such a clearer, such a sweetener, such a softener, such a delicious mollifier. After having my hands in it for only a few minutes, my fingers felt like eels and began, as it were, to serpentine and spiralize. As I sat there at my ease, cross-legged on the deck, after the bitter exertion at the windlass, under a blue tranquil sky, the ship under indolent sail, and gliding so serenely along, as I bathed my hands among those soft, gentle globules of infiltrated tissues, woven almost within the hour, as they richly broke to my fingers and discharged all their opulence, like fully ripe grapes their wine, as I snuffed up that uncontaminated aroma, 
literally and truly like the smell of spring violets. I declare to you that for the time I lived as in a musky meadow. I forgot all about our horrible oath. In that inexpressible sperm I washed my hands and my heart of it. I almost began to credit the old Paracelsian superstition that sperm is of rare virtue in allaying the heat of anger. While bathing in that bath, I felt divinely free from all ill-will or petulance or malice of any sort whatsoever. Squeeze, 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 all the morning long I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborers' hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget, that at last I was continually squeezing their hands, and looking up into their eyes sentimentally, as much as to say, Oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerbities, or know the slightest ill-humour or envy? Come, let us squeeze hands all round, Nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. Would that I could keep squeezing that sperm forever. For now, since by many prolonged repeated experiences, I have perceived that in all cases man must eventually lower, or at least shift his conceit of attainable felicity, not placing it anywhere in the intellect or the fancy, but in the wife, the heart, the bed, the table, the saddle, the fireside, the country. Now that I have perceived all this, I am ready to squeeze case eternally. In thoughts of the visions of the night, I saw long rows of angels in paradise, each with his hands in a jar of spermaceti. Now, while discoursing on sperm, it behooves to speak of other things akin to it, in the business of preparing the sperm whale for the tri-works. First comes white horse, so called, which is obtained from the tapering part of the fish, and also from the thicker portions of his flukes. It is tough with congealed tendons, a wad of muscle, but still contains some oil. After being severed from the whale, the white horse is first cut into portable oblongs, ere going to the mincer. They look much like blocks of Berkshire marble. Plum pudding is the term bestowed upon certain fragmentary parts of the whale's flesh, here and there adhering to the blanket of blubber, and often participating to a considerable degree in its unctuousness. It is a most refreshing, convivial, beautiful object to behold. As its name imports, it is of an exceedingly rich mottled tint, with a bestreaked snowy and golden ground, dotted with spots of the deepest crimson and purple. It is plums of rubies in pictures of citron. Spite of reason, it is hard to keep yourself from eating it. I confess that once I stole behind the foremast to try it. It tasted something as I should conceive a royal cutlet from the thigh of Louis Le Gros might have tasted, supposing him to have been killed the first day after the venison season, and that particular venison season contemporary with an unusually fine vintage of the vineyards of Champagne. There is another substance, and a very singular one, which turns up in the course of this business, but which I feel it to be very puzzling adequately to describe, it is called slob gallion, an appellation original with the whaleman, and even so is the nature of the substance. It is an ineffably oozy, stringy affair, most frequently found in the tubs of sperm after a prolonged squeezing and subsequent decanting. I hold it to be the wondrously thin, ruptured membranes of the case, coalescing. Glurry, so called, is a term properly belonging to right whalemen, but sometimes incidentally used by the sperm fishermen. It designates the dark, glutinous substance which is scraped off the back of the Greenland or right whale, and much of which covers the decks of those inferior souls who hunt that ignoble leviathan. 
nippers. Strictly this word is not indigenous to the whale's vocabulary, but as applied by whalemen it becomes so. A whaleman's nipper is the short, firm strip of tendinous stuff cut from the tapering part of the leviathan's tail. It averages an inch in thickness, and for the rest is about the size of the iron part of a hoe. Edgewise moved along the oily deck, it operates like a leathern squilgee, and by nameless blandishments, as of magic, allures along with it all impurities. But to learn all about these recondite matters, your best way is at once to descend into the blubber room, and have a long talk with its inmates. This place has previously been mentioned as the receptacle for the blanket pieces when stripped and hoisted from the whale. When the proper time arrives for cutting up its contents, this apartment is a scene of terror to all tyros, especially by night. On one side, lit by a dull lantern, a space has been left clear for the workmen. They generally go in pairs, a pike and gaffman and a spademan. The whaling pike is similar to a frigate's boarding weapon of the same name. The gaff is something like a boat hook. With his gaff, the gaffman hooks on to a sheet of blubber and strives to hold it from slipping as the ship pitches and lurches about. Meanwhile, the spademan stands on the sheet itself, perpendicularly chopping it into the portable horse pieces. This spade is sharp as hone can make it. The spademan's feet are shoeless. The thing he stands on will sometimes irresistibly slide away from him like a sledge. If he cuts off one of his own toes, or one of his assistants, would you be very much astonished? Toes are scarce among veteran blubber-room men. Chapter 95 The Cassock Had you stepped on board the Pequod at a certain juncture of this post-mortemizing of the whale, and had you strolled forward nigh the windlass, pretty sure am I that you would have scanned with no small curiosity a very strange enigmatical object, which you would have seen there lying along lengthwise in the lee scuppers not the wondrous cistern in the whale's huge head, not the prodigy of his unhinged lower jaw, not the miracle of his symmetrical tail, none of these would so surprise you as half a glimpse of that unaccountable cone, longer than a Kentuckian is tall, nigh a foot in diameter at the base, and jet-black as Yojo, the ebony idol of Queequeg. And an idol indeed it is, or rather in old times its likeness was, such an idol as that found in the secret groves of Queen Macha in Judea, and for worshipping which King Asa her son did depose her, and destroyed the idol, and burnt it for an abomination at the brook Kedron, as darkly set forth in the fifteenth chapter of the first book of Kings. Look at the sailor called the Mincer, who now comes along, and assisted by two allies, heavily backs the Grandissimus, as mariners call it, and with bowed shoulders staggers off with it as if he were a grenadier carrying a dead comrade from the field. Extending it upon the forecastle deck, he now proceeds cylindrically to remove its dark pelt, as an African hunter the pelt of a boa. This done, he turns the pelt inside out, like a pantaloon leg, gives it a good stretching so as almost to double its diameter, and at last hangs it well spread to the rigging to dry. Ere long it is taken down, when removing some three feet of it towards the pointed extremity, and then cutting two slits for armholes at the other end, he lengthwise slips himself bodily into it. The mincer now stands before you invested in the full canonicals of his calling. Immemorial to all his order, this investiture alone will adequately protect him while employed in the peculiar functions of his office. That office consists in mincing the horse pieces of blubber for the pots, an operation which is conducted at a curious wooden horse, planted endwise against the bulwarks, and with a capacious tub beneath it, into which the minced pieces drop, fast as the sheets from a rapt orator's desk. Arrayed in decent black, occupying a conspicuous pulpit, intent on Bible leaves, what a candidate for an archbishopric! What a lad for a pope, were this mincer! 
FOOTNOTE. Bible leaves! Bible leaves! This is the invariable cry from the mates to the mincer. It enjoins him to be careful and cut his work into as thin slices as possible, inasmuch as, by so doing, the business of boiling out the oil is much accelerated, and its quantity considerably increased, besides perhaps improving it in quality. End of footnote. Chapter 96 the tri works besides her hoisted boats an american whaler is outwardly distinguished by her tri works she presents the curious anomaly of the most solid masonry joining with oak and hemp in constituting the completed ship it is as if from the open field a brick kiln were transported to her planks the tri works are planted between the foremast and the mainmast the most roomy part of the deck. The timbers beneath are of a peculiar strength, fitted to sustain the weight of an almost solid mass of brick and mortar some ten feet by eight square, and five in height. The foundation does not penetrate the deck, but the masonry is firmly secured to the surface by ponderous knees of iron, bracing it on all sides, and screwing it down to the timbers. On the flanks it is cased with wood, and at top completely covered by a large sloping battened hatchway. Removing this hatch we expose the great tripods, two in number, and each of several barrels capacity. When not in use they are kept remarkably clean. Sometimes they are polished with soapstone and sand, till they shine within like silver punch bowls. During the night watches some cynical old sailors will crawl into them and coil themselves away there for a nap. While employed in polishing them, one man in each pot side by side, many confidential communications are carried on over the iron lips. It is a place also for profound mathematical meditation. It was in the left-hand tripod of the Pequod, with the soapstone diligently circling round me, that I was first indirectly struck by the remarkable fact that in geometry all bodies gliding along the cycloid, my soapstone, for example, will descend from any point in precisely the same time. Removing the fireboard from the front of the triworks, the bare masonry of that side is exposed, penetrated by the two iron mouths of the furnaces, directly underneath the pots. These mouths are fitted with heavy doors of iron. The intense heat of the fire is prevented from communicating itself to the deck by means of a shallow reservoir extending under the entire enclosed surface of the works. By a tunnel inserted at the rear, this reservoir is kept replenished with water as fast as it evaporates. There are no external chimneys, they open direct from the rear wall. And here let us go back for a moment. It was about nine o'clock at night that the Pequod's triworks were first started on this present voyage. It belonged to Stubb to oversee the business. All ready there? Off hatch then, and starter. You cook, fire the works. This was an easy thing, for the carpenter had been thrusting his shavings into the furnace throughout the passage. Here be it said that in a whaling voyage the first fire in the triworks has to be fed for a time with wood. After that no wood is used except as a means of quick ignition to the staple fuel. In a word, after being tried out, the crisp shriveled blubber, now called scraps or fritters, still contains considerable of its unctuous properties. These fritters feed the flames. Like a plethoric burning martyr or self-consuming misanthrope, once ignited, the whale supplies his own fuel and burns by his own body. Would that he consumed his own smoke, for his smoke is horrible to inhale, and inhale it you must, and not only that, but you must live in it for the time. It has an unspeakable wild Hindu odor about it, such as may lurk in the vicinity of funeral pyres. It smells like the left wing of the Day of Judgment. It is an argument for the pit. By midnight the works were in full operation. We were clear from the carcass, sail had been made, the wind was freshening, the wild ocean darkness was intense. 
but that darkness was licked up by the fierce flames, which at intervals forked forth from the sooty flues, and illuminated every lofty rope in the rigging, as with the famed Greek fire. The burning ship drove on as if remorselessly commissioned to some vengeful deed, so the pitch and sulphur-freighted brigs of the bold hydriote canaris issuing from their midnight harbours with broad sheets of flame for sails bore down upon the turkish frigates and folded them in conflagrations the hatch removed from the top of the works now afforded a wide hearth in front of them standing on this were the tartarian shapes of the pagan harpooners always the whale-ships stokers with huge pronged poles they pitched hissing masses of blubber into the scalding pots, or stirred up the fires beneath, till the snaky flames darted, curling, out of the doors to catch them by the feet. The smoke rolled away in sullen heaps. To every pitch of the ship there was a pitch of the boiling oil, which seemed all eagerness to leap into their faces. Opposite the mouth of the works, on the further side of the wide wooden hearth, was the windlass. This served for a sea-sofa. Here lounged the watch, when not otherwise employed, looking into the red heat of the fire till their eyes felt scorched in their heads. Their tawny features, now all begrimed with smoke and sweat, their matted beards, and the contrasting barbaric brilliancy of their teeth, all these were strangely revealed in the capricious emblazonings of the works. As they narrated to each other their unholy adventures, their tales of terror told in words of mirth, as their uncivilized laughter forked upwards out of them, like the flames from the furnace, as to and fro in their front the harpooners wildly gesticulated with their huge pronged forks and dippers, as the wind howled on, and the sea leaped, and the ship groaned and dived, and yet steadfastly shot her red hell further and further into the blackness of the sea and the night, and scornfully champed the white bone in her mouth, and viciously spat round her on all sides. Then the rushing Pequod, freighted with savages, and laden with fire, and burning a corpse, and plunging into that blackness of darkness, seemed the material counterpart of her monomaniac commander's soul. So seemed it to me, as I stood at her helm, and for long hours silently guided the way of this fire-ship on the sea. Wrapped for that interval in darkness myself, I but the better saw the redness, the madness, the ghastliness of others. The continual sight of the fiend shapes before me, capering half in smoke and half in fire, these at last begat kindred visions in my soul, so soon as I began to yield to that unaccountable drowsiness which ever would come over me at a midnight helm. But that night in particular a strange, and ever since inexplicable, thing occurred to me. Starting from a brief standing sleep, I was horribly conscious of something fatally wrong. The jawbone tiller smote my side, which leaned against it, in my ears was the low hum of sails, just beginning to shake in the wind. I thought my eyes were open. I was half conscious of putting my fingers to the lids, and mechanically stretching them still further apart. But spite of all this, I could see no compass before me to steer by. Though it seemed but a minute since I had been watching the card, by the steady binnacle lamp illuminating it. Nothing seemed before me but a jet gloom, now and then made ghastly by flashes of redness. Uppermost was the impression that whatever swift rushing thing I stood on was not so much bound to any haven ahead as rushing from all havens astern. A stark, bewildered feeling as of death came over me. Convulsively my hands grasped the tiller, but with the crazy conceit that the tiller was, somehow, in some enchanted way, inverted. My God, what is the matter with me, I thought. Lo, in my brief sleep I had turned myself about, and was fronting the ship's stern, with my back to her prow and the compass. In an instant I faced back, just in time to prevent the vessel from flying up into the wind, and very probably capsizing her. How glad and how grateful the relief from this unnatural hallucination of the night, and the fatal contingency of being brought by the lee. 
Look not too long in the face of fire, O man. Never dream with thy hand on the helm. Turn not thy back to the compass. Accept the first hint of the hitching tiller. Believe not the artificial fire, when its redness makes all things look ghastly. Tomorrow, in the natural sun, the skies will be bright. Those who glared like devils in the forking flames, the morn will show in far other, at least gentler, relief. The glorious, golden, glad sun, the only true lamp, all others but liars. Nevertheless, the sun hides not Virginia's dismal swamp, nor Rome's accursed Campagna, nor wide Sahara, nor all the millions of miles of deserts and of griefs beneath the moon. The sun hides not the ocean, which is the dark side of this earth, and which is two-thirds of this earth. So, therefore, that mortal man who hath more of joy than sorrow in him, that mortal man cannot be true, not true or undeveloped. With books the same, the truest of all men was the man of sorrows, and the truest of all books is Solomon's, and Ecclesiastes is the fine-hammered steel of woe. All is vanity. All. This willful world hath not got hold of unchristian Solomon's wisdom yet. But he who dodges hospitals and jails, and walks fast crossing graveyards, and would rather talk of operas than hell, calls Cowper, Young, Pascal, Rousseau, poor devils all of sick men, and throughout a carefree lifetime swears by Rabelais as passing wise and therefore jolly, not that man is fitted to sit down on tombstones and break the green damp mould with unfathomably wondrous Solomon. But even Solomon, he says, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain, i.e., even while living, in the congregation of the dead. Give not thyself up, then, to fire, lest it invert thee, deaden thee, as for the time it did me. There is a wisdom that is woe, but there is a woe that is madness. And there is a Catskill eagle in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges, and soar out of them again, and become invisible in the sunny spaces. And even if he forever flies within the gorge, that gorge is in the mountains, so that even in his lowest swoop the mountain eagle is still higher than other birds upon the plain even though they soar. End of chapters 92 to 96